Hello, everyone. Welcome back for Financially Fit. Um, we had a little vacation last week, or at least one of us had a vacation last week. So uh, we took the week off and uh, we're back at it, back and running this week with uh, some uh, interesting market news. Um, I would say the last week uh, has been very volatile. And we just wanted to make a quick video on the volatility in the market just to kind of hear our thoughts of what's going on and show you some mind boggling uh, statistics or tell you about some mind boggling statistics throughout this. And as we're sitting here today, it was funny, five minutes ago, we were looking at the market and the NASDAQ was down and now it's uh, up almost 1%. So uh, just some interesting times in the stock market and we're gonna touch on a few of them. But one of the, you know, one of the things that Tanya and I were talking about, um, and if you haven't tuned in, I guess I should do it a little introduction. My name is Alan Dembski with Buffalo First Wealth Management, along with our featured advisor, Tanya Baya, um, which joins me every week. So I don't know if you're featured. Are you considered featured? I'm always featured. Oh, okay, good. Or just, I'm always uh, important. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, so now as we're heading into... Um, the stock market volatility. It's funny because last year we had that, you know, March and April with COVID coming into play and the market, you know, down 10, 12 percent in any given day. Um, then we had quite the run up towards the fourth quarter. So I think expectations got a little out of hand with the way that the market and the economy, how they work together. And one of the things um, Tanya wants to touch on real quick here is the market volatility that we've been experiencing as well. Hi, everybody. And yeah, I was the one that was on vacation. We went down. <laughs> I got to go to New Orleans and I am officially uh, have have been in, in 50 states, uh, not nice. just airports, but although, yeah, visited all 50 states. It was very cool. Uh, it went really well along with my 50th birthday. So that all worked out well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, we, you know, you're not supposed to share your age, by the way. I am proud. I am 50. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> yes, that's what I've been told by my friends who are all 50 plus as well. They're all very, <laughs> we're all very happy to be where we are. Um, that's good. Yeah. So, uh, yes, part of the volatility was, as, as Helen said, uh, there was a real run up. In fact, I was talking to one of my clients recently who asked me, what is an average sort of what is considered a good year for growth in someone's portfolio. And I was like, well, we all, we, we, we really strive, you know, a good one is something maybe between seven and 10%, you know, I mean, that's just like a good sort of growth. And in the last quarter, there was, the percentage was huge. I mean, we are talking double digits, double. And so uh, the idea of what normal is for all of us is a very um, kind of gotten skewed a little bit. So, and as you're looking at now, we're watching the tech companies just get hammered. And part of that was, is because of, People are thinking that they're they're kind of overvaluing evalu overvalued now, and that they want and that uh, clients want to start putting stuff or in, investors want to put start putting stuff into other areas of this uh, other areas of the stock market. Um, and in following that up, uh, you know there there's also there's also some supply sort shortages. And uh, another interesting thing happened because I it turns out both of my boys are in college at the moment, and they're both taking. Um, uh, economics classes, one's macro, one's micro. And part of that is, you know, the, the economy right now and the inflation is also causing some issues. Uh, and I heard this really cool story because, you know, a lot of people don't understand what uh, inflation, what, what, what the, what the, how the inflation deal, how inflation deals with economy and how our economy, how it relates to us specifically. So I, I heard this uh, story on NPR and I wanted to pass it on to you because I feel like it really sort of explained everything. We've all heard, unless, you're, unless you've are been living under a rock, we've all heard about how the car companies are having trouble because there aren't enough microchips out there. All right. And that came from uh, for two reasons. One with the microchips that, you know, we had a problem with COVID. We had a problem with people making it. We had a, we had problems with their 
being people to be able to make it. We had problems with there being people to be able to move it, you know, to, to, to get it to places. And so there weren't as many cars. And it turned out that even while COVID was going on, people still wanted to buy cars. And so, um, and they, and, and nobody was traveling. So more, there were more and more used cars that were being sold. And in that being the case, uh, a lot of companies, um, for instance, like Hertz or, or, you know, any of the rental companies started selling off their cars because there was, you know, there, there was a demand for them. Uh, so now is everybody is starting to go out and, uh, you know, for the, the airlines now are, you know, have more seats available. Well, mm -hmm. the, uh, the story started actually in Glacier National Park where there are companies out there that haven't had anybody come for quite a while and are now, you know, everybody's, you know, whether you have, people are starting to move around because we have uh, the vaccinations, they're starting to look for places to go and get out of the house. Um, and, they're, and they wanna go whitewater rafting and, you know, and, and Glacier is a great place to do it. And this, this one small company was saying they're having to ask questions they've never asked before because people are calling up and they're getting all filled up but there's one issue, there's no rental cars. There's no way to get the people from the airport to where they're going. So they're having to ask because the people coming in, flying in, if they have the ability to get from the airport <laughs> to, to Glacier National Park. So they can, um, uh, so, that, you know, so they can get on their whitewater rafting tour. And isn't that a weird thing? Uh, here, everything's starting to open up, but because of, uh, you know, a, a certain type of the, a certain piece of the economy, other, co other companies now are being um, hit by things that they didn't expect. They thought, this company thought that once it was open, it would be great, people would come, and everybody wants to come, but now they can't quite get there because of a lack of cars, because of a lack of um, you know, because of, because of a short supply. Well, it's funny you mentioned that because in, my brother owns two restaurants and we were talking about chicken wings, you know, Buffalo, that's a staple here in Buffalo. So if you're yeah. from outside the area, uh, we are in Buffalo, New York. So uh, we were talking about chicken wings. So you said it, it's not so much that there's a shortage of chickens. Right. It's a shortage of people to process the chickens. Thus they're getting fatter because <laughs> they're eating and they're not, being processed this fast and that delay is increasing the size of the chicken which and then the shortage increases the price and then people are paying more for less because you're paying per pound but here in buffalo people aren't charged by the pound like in a, many parts of the country they're charged per wing right. and now the whole price structure is getting thrown off it's just an interesting dynamic with everything that's been happening in the economy whether it's chicken wings or even white water rafting. Or white water rafting. And that's how, and that's why when you think about inflation, that's what's happening. The prices are going up. Why are they going up? There are shortages in certain places. And, and, and the funny, parts, funny part is, is that in our daily lives, we, you know, you don't realize that uh, something like, you know, people not being able to process chicken wings or micro microchips or just a lack of cars because they were all sold could come back and really uh, affect all the rest of us. Yeah, I guess there's not too many Ubers or Lyft drivers in uh, the outskirts of Montana. Not in Montana. <laughs> From what I understand, it's a bigger problem out there than it is, for instance, in New York City. <laughs> so, and I think that all leads to like uh, over exaggerated, exaggerated expectations of the market. Uh, the market is not truly a necessary indicator of the economy. Mm -hmm. um, it is part of a leading indicator towards what the economy is going to be, but it's not truly indicative of the economy. Just for an example, so we're talking inflation, and I, I think you did some research on the inflations around three and a half or something. Yeah, actually, yeah. They said recently it's almost to four. Yeah. So almost four. So a little bit higher than, I mean, when we do financial planning, we usually use a 3%. Right. Uh, inflation. Right. So two to three. Right. And and for the last number of years, it's been closer to 1.5. So it yeah. definitely has grown. You know, it's definitely grown. 
Well, yeah, it's putting pressure on the system, but just so you, you know, we did some research on the S&P 500, the NASDAQ, the Dow, yeah, and uh, we did the bond market. So if you have a, a, you know, a diversified portfolio in the stocks and bonds, uh, get a load of these numbers. And I'm going to go back to your tech real quick here. I just read something um, out of the 495 or out of the S&P 500, there's 500 stocks, 495 average 3% rate of return last year. The S&P did 15%. Okay. So five companies, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Facebook average 65%. So if you weren't in any of those five names, you may, you may have only averaged 3%. The NASDAQ was up 43% and it, it's break even as of today. The Dow was up 7% last year and after the first five months here, it's up 11. But get a load of the treasury bonds. Treasury bonds, uh, long-term, we're talking long-term, not short-term. Treasury bonds last year were up 17.6%. This year, down 13%. And just a long-term bond fund, which would incorporate government securities, usually more on the corporate side, was up 15% last year. It's down 10% this year, year to date. So very, you know, in diversification, you know, not putting all your eggs in one basket, if you will, um, you, you just never know what sector is going to be up, what sector is going to be down. I mean, who would have thought last year when the uh, stock market, let's add all three together. Let's say we'll average maybe 17% last year. Let's just average that. And now this year, and then you have the bonds averaging almost 17%. Now everything is way off um, with a lot of different pressures that are on the market, whether it's inflation, um, the cyber attacks and everything else that you can probably pinpoint on but you can't panic sell. Panic sell, if you would have panic sold last year, you probably would have missed out on that NASDAQ of 43% greater return. Yes. Yeah. So I mean, going forward, you know, the whole, you know, maybe you look at diversification methods as well as just stocks, bonds, real estate, um, maybe even gold, um, some different commodities in your portfolio that could help with inflationary type uh, pressures that are on the market. And be patient. That's the other thing. I think if nothing else, uh, you know, again, there was from uh, March, you know, if you take a look at if you from April to, you know, January of this year versus what might happen next, you just, you long-term uh, diversification is definitely the way to go because it really does help you continue to grow. Uh, there, there are definitely your 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 uh, your drops are faster drops, but overall, it, you, you, the whole process, the whole stock market. you if you are diversified, you will continue to grow over the long term. But um, it, it does definitely. You definitely don't want to be looking at it on a daily basis. Uh, not if you're somebody who's going to be concerned or worried because right now it is definitely going up and down depending on you know on a daily on the daily on a daily take well like i said at the beginning is we one minute we were sitting in the office talking about what we were going to talk about in the video and the nasdaq was down and then it was up one percent it's like well okay i guess five ten minutes is a really a difference maker yeah. um but certainly invest in things that you feel comfortable with on uh, that you kind of understand or your advisor is helping understand or he understands with you. But that's part of our job too, is not to react uh, emotionally to the market pressures because what is there probably 300 some trading days, I would imagine. Yeah. I don't know the exact number off the top of my head. And you know, let, let's say the last six days have been negative. Right. Yes. Yeah, short term, that's, that's painful to watch and it's painful on the portfolio and it's painful on your long-term goals. But if you stay focused and look beyond those five, six days, okay, let's give it a month, maybe even two months and then reevaluate after that. Short-term, you can't just mortgage your whole future on a few days. I agree. And the idea is, especially when you're talking to someone like Alan or me, we've done our research. We, you know, 
the the kind of uh, pro, the kind of plate things we put you in you know we've looked at the management that's key it's huge if you know if you as you, as Alan said comfortable we are comfortable with the uh, man the management of the funds or the ETFs that we put our clients in because we've done the research on it um, that's pretty much our job and so. Just uh, if you get nervous, you know, just call and talk to your, your financial planner or call and talk to us and, you know, we can help you review and just take a real good look at what you're in and, is it, and you can know that we really understand what your options are. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, when it comes to the selling thing, we've had this conversation that non-retirement accounts are the tough ones. Right. Because yeah. if you panic sell and you have a non retirement account, just an open account, we, we kind of talked about like a Robin Hood or a Weeble or a Stash account. Some of these online brokerage companies, they're not there to help you and talk you through of, you know, should I sell this? Well, it's down 5% today. Maybe I should sell it. Well, did you know last year you were up 120% on that fund? And now you're going to pay tax. Uh, capital gains on that. So not only are you taking your 5% loss, but add another 15% for capital gains tax and having maybe write it, maybe you just broke even on your taxes next year, add another five grand if you sold a big lot to your actual tax bill. Yeah, that's absolutely true because, you know, it can look very scary when you see uh, something drop like 5% one day, another 5% another day. Oh my gosh, it's down 10%. But then to to really have the understanding that, you know, over the past six months, it's grown 50 percent or something. And so dropping that five percent, five percent, you're still up by a, you know, a large amount. But sometimes it's hard to see past that red that pops up. Yeah, it is. It is painful. And as advisors, you know, we, we think the same thing. Oh, my God, look at the sky is falling. And we have to sometimes talk ourselves down and say, listen. Let's talk about the long term. If we're short term, we're, we got to understand the volatility, especially coming out of a pandemic or hopefully coming out of a pandemic um, that hasn't been, what, 100 years or whatever it's been since the last one and never really an understanding of how this market's uh, taking that into account. I have to say, my, my, my husband laughs at me because he will tell me that I am the only one who gets excited about seeing uh, the stock market go down because I always figure that if it's going down, there's a, there's a good chance to buy something more. And, he, and he, I'm the, he says, I'm also the only one who gets grumpy when the stock market goes up too much because then I can't do that. I can't do that for my clients. But if it drops, then I can, I can make some good buys for them. Right. And timing is a lot to do with it. However, it's hard to time the market. Oh, yeah. No, no, I don't. Yeah. Not I mean, uh, I'll, I'll just use the other day as an example. The NASDAQ was down two and a half percent and it ended up the day positive. So if you would have panic sold in the morning at two percent, you missed out on that rebound later on in the afternoon. Similar to what I talked about earlier. Um, I keep using the NASDAQ because this year it's pretty volatile in the ups and downs of that particular index. Yeah. I think that's a good point, too, is that uh, that says something, you know, if you look at the Dow and it was up 7% last year or something like that, you, you yeah. know, this is those are the companies that have really been, you know, they're, they're strong, they're strong companies that have been there for years, and they have more of them have dividends, and they don't, they aren't quite as volatile as the rest of, you know, the other companies. Um, and that kind of gives you an idea of you know, how diversification can help you as well to have those have companies that are in the Dow's in Dow in your, you know, in your um, in your portfolio, and then to have some of the uh, some other types of companies ETFs that are more along the uh, risk, you know, riskier side. Uh, so I'm going to use a, a little Navy uh, analogy here. So the Dow is like that big aircraft carrier, kind of just slowly moves through the ocean. And then you, you have your NASDAQ last year was more like your little destroyer kind of moving in and out and <laughs> kind of can zip around, right? <laughs> That's true. Yes, it definitely can move a lot easier. <laughs> so with that, um, we just wanted to touch base today and kind of go over our takes on a little bit of the market volatility. Um, you can certainly follow us on Facebook, uh, one for the videos and two, um, the chief investment officer for Charles Schwab, who we custodian through, 
we generally will post uh, Lizanne Saunders comments on Facebook on her weekly report. If you want to take a look at those um, next week, we have some interesting topics coming on. So make sure you tune in again. Uh, but certainly you can follow us on YouTube and Facebook uh, going forward here. So with that, we're going to sign off for today and have a great day, everybody. Happy weekend, guys. Bye.